Hello and welcome to the Book Club on Sports Tonight Live. It's the place where we occasionally meld the world of sports and books. And joining us on this occasion uh, here in the studio is Paul Watson. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, he's the author of Up Pompeii, um, this uh, fantastic book which I, I have sort of been hardly able to put down over the last few days, uh, uh, which has been difficult because I've been very busy. I've been doing a lot of driving around the country, a lot of stand-up gigs, and this has sort of occasionally got in the way because uh, it's been such Sorry a gripping read. That. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm glad you're, ap you're apologising. It, it's very good. Uh, it's a it's an extraordinary kind of, for me, it sort of feels like a mis mixture between cool runnings and um, beating the Moldovans at tennis. Uh, that kind of um, a challenge book where you've got to achieve some kind of almost impossible goal, but an underdog story as well. Uh, is that, did I get the right idea from the book? Yeah, I think so. Um, I certainly see it as, um, it starts out with quite a kind of frivolous, um, kind of laddish idea that you want to play for the world's worst international football team. It's that thought that I think all football fans go through at some point. Of well, initially you want to play for the best, but then you realise yes. that's not going to happen. Well, initially you want to play for England, yeah. uh, and then you realise that however bad things get, I probably won't get that knock on the door. Um, and you come to this realisation that in order to do that, you're going to have to find a way of, of playing for a country that perhaps you're not from, uh, which has been done. Vinnie Jones played for Wales. He mm -hmm. had been to Wales before he had the first cap for Wales. Um, so. Yeah, me and my flatmate just decided what if we could find a country that was kind of so poor at football that we could play for them. So it was much more born out of a, of a love and a desire for, to play football than a part of this current, sort of current contemporary literary tradition of doing a challenge book, you know, the, the Dave Gormans, the Tony Hawks. Yeah, I think if anyone sets out trying to write a challenge book, what, what, what comes out is going to be fairly repulsive because right. I think what was kind of nice was, although it was a bit of a selfish and slightly stupid idea, it was an idea that was born of, you know, 25 years of wanting to do something, mm -hmm. always dreaming of being a footballer. Um, and I played at, you know, semi-professional level, but I was always kind of the worst at that level in the squad. So, you know, it's this sudden dawning on you that not many people from the age of 25 pull it back to play for their country. Mm. Um, so we might have to do something a little bit more outlandish. So it was an outlandish idea to try and find some way that you could play, but of course you didn't end up playing, you ended up coaching, which in a way was a, um, even a bigger ask. Uh, and how did, you, how did you happen upon Pompeii, which is spelt, uh, we must point out, um, P-O-H-N-P-E-I, but it's a very nice joke on up Pompeii, the Frankie Howard. Yeah, we always thought we'd, uh, that was a working title, we said, we'll oh, come right, up with something much I was going to ask you yep. if you were going to have other options. It, it's like with, like with all novels, you're forced to give it a name before you've really got a book. Right. So it was suggested to me, oh, you could call it up Pompeii. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll put that on it for a few months. Now um, we can see Pompeii in the background. It looks like an absolute paradise. Uh, how did you happen upon it as the, the, the goal for your team? So what happened was, we, it was me and my flatmate Matt Conrad, uh, and we were searching for the worst football nation. So we went down the FIFA rankings to the very bottom, and you're, you're looking at teams like Montserrat and Aruba. Yep. Mm -hmm. But even these teams have got players that you will have probably heard of, or you will have seen playing for, for teams like Peterborough, Scarborough, right. even, you know, teams that I couldn't dream of playing for. Right. So you have to go a bit further. Mm -hmm. So we find a list of teams that aren't recognised by FIFA. Uh, for various political or geographical reasons. Mm -hmm. and at the very bottom of there, you find Pompeii, who have never won a match uh, and recently lost 16-1 to Guam. Right. And it's at that point that we kind of think, you know, Eureka, if we can play for anyone, we can play for them. It right. just so happens that Pompeii is an incredibly beautiful island in Micronesia, mm -hmm. which is tiny, tiny little area in the, kind of the centre of the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. more or less as far away from England as you can possibly get. Right in the middle of the Pacific, uh, it's in between uh, uh, Manila and Honolulu, uh, yeah. sort of, and it's, I think a lot of people don't even think that Micronesia is real, because I think yeah. Zooland, they think Zooland have made it up. Right? Yeah, it does sound very made up, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think a lot of people thought that what I'd succeeded in doing was having an incredible kind of delusional 12, 18 months where yeah. I, I kind of pretended there was a country called Micronesia, <laughs> but no, this is it, and it yeah. exists. So, um, so you, you found this, they were at the bottom of the list, and they were mm. unranked. Uh, and you, you, what were your first impressions when you arrived? What's the, you know, describe the country, describe your, your feelings. You're a long way from home, you're probably jet lagged. Mm. And your first impressions are? Your first impressions are, um, you kind of call a, a, a kick around, kind of a practice session, mm -hmm. and you, you try and get the word around via contacts of our, our guide out there, he's called Charles Masana. And one person turns up initially. Um, he's later followed by maybe six or seven people who mm -hmm. Uh, kick a ball around fairly aimlessly, hoot at each other, slide 90 yards on their face into each other's kneecaps, 
uh, and you have a bit of a moment of thinking, I just threw in my job, um, went about you know, 7,000 miles away from my girlfriend and spent all the money I have in the world to come here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it seems a bit of and a it's kind hot, of, dry, wet. It's it's well, it's both. It's uh, it's incredibly hot, right. uh, about thirty-five degrees most days. But it's also the third wettest place in the world. The third wettest place. So rain rains every worse day. Worse than Manchester. Yes, right, okay. <laughs> and that's the thing. I think being English, we had this slightly cocky idea that we knew a little <laughs> bit about rain. No, you this get is there. Tropical rain. And, yeah, this <laughs> is serious rain, and the pitch floods within ten minutes. Right. Uh, the pitch will go from bone dry to flooded, mm -hmm. and it's fairly terrifying trying to run a football training session when the conditions can change like that. So the conditions are bad, it's a very, very small uh, country. You arrive there and they've, they've got no real tradition um, of uh, sport. You know, I think they had a, a marathon runner in the Beijing Olympics who came last yes, uh, and actually Elias delayed Rodriguez. the closing ceremony. Because That's he... actually a myth, Is it? Um, oh, which okay. I found out later on. Um, he did come last in the marathon, but um, I mean, largely because if you tried to run a marathon on Pompeii, you fall off the edge. <laughs> but um, he he finished last in the marathon, but he became a national hero in right. the country. He wasn't that much after the second last person. But um, yeah, there's not a huge tradition of sport. And the sport that is played is basketball, right. uh, mostly. And that's because of the American influence. Uh -huh. But oddly, Micronesians have about an average height of five foot six, five foot seven. So basketball isn't ideal. So it's not really the sport you'd think of to, to, to give them. They're perfectly built for football. Right. Um, well, well, this is the team, and now obviously that's them in kit. Yes. That's the, that's the, the, the team kit. Yes. Um, uh, but when you turned up, you had, you'd, you'd got sort of donated kit. Who we were did. the teams that you... Well, we approached every single football team. Right, in, right from the top in, of the Premier from League. From the top all the way down, to, in fact, including teams that probably had less money than I did. You know, teams about to go out of business. <laughs> right. Uh, and like the teams, Portsmouth. <laughs> yeah, like Portsmouth. <laughs> and the teams that actually responded were not the ones you'd expect. The right. Premier League teams gave us... Absolutely nothing. Spurs mm. very kindly offered to sell us some shirts at the same price they were in the club shop. <laughs> nice. Um, but Yeovil Tan were the real heroes. They immediately sent us a load of shiny kits and said, it's all yours, mm -hmm. take them out there. Um, Norwich good were very good. Good on you, Yeovil. Yeovil and Norwich. Well, good. Um, and those were the kits we went out there with. Right. We dipped into our own pockets to buy a load of boots, um, mm -hmm. shin pads and socks, and just kind of went over there with this huge, basically with football in a bag, mm -hmm. and just thought what can we do with this and I, I presume some of them uh, some of the players uh, uh, talk us through who's this this is uh, uh, this is uh, Larry Coyne this is much later on when we had built uh, a Pompeii team and we wanted right. to take them away to play an international fixture right. uh, which was kind of the culmination of the book uh, we had no sponsors and it looked like the whole thing was was doomed um, and this guy Larry Coyne mm -hmm. stepped in at the 11th hour and sponsored the team mm -hmm. uh, so we got these lovely shiny Coyne Airways shirts um, and most importantly we got to take a team of 16 islanders to Guam for a tour, mm. which was kind of the finale yeah, so of that's, the book. That's the kind of climax of the yes. book is when it sort of gets to the stage where you're actually starting to, to, to really play football, that the team are starting to learn. But there was a level of skill. I mean, some of these, some of these kids uh, could play football. Well, this is the thing. What, what, uh, what happens in the first few chapters is we see this kind of gaggle of people who seem to have very little interest and very little knowledge how to play football. Mm. Um, but later on, it, it, when we, we return home, um, and it turns out that actually there was a, a guy on the island called Dilshan who happened to be off the island visiting his brother, mm. who'd been coaching kind of this small band of players for about 18 months. This is Dilshan in the middle here. Right. Um, and Dilshan is a fantastically talented player. He'd played in Manila briefly, uh, semi-freshly. And so I'm kind of persuaded that there is enough on the island for me to bother going back there and trying to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I go back and find this group of really talented but quite raw players. Mm. From there, we build a league uh, and we start training up more and more players. So we get you know, first two teams, three teams, four teams, set up a league with five teams. And that's when things really turn. Uh, it becomes quite serious then because instead of it being kind of few people kicking a ball around and squawking at each other, <laughs> it's actually a serious league and we, we rule it as if it's the Premier League. We have officials who we train up, um, we referee games to the letter of the law. Mm. Um, and suddenly we start to get some really talented players who have been playing the game for a matter of weeks and months these are players that suddenly are more talented than a lot of players i used to play with at semi-professional level mm. and it started me thinking you know this isn't this isn't a joke anymore we yeah. could actually go to guam and avenge this 16-1 defeat but the the thing that i, I it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely book and i really what 
one of the things that's particularly good about it is seeing it from your point of view because you're clearly sort of you're bright uh, and you see that it's like a, a, a crazy it's a little bit selfish a little bit you, you know you're not naturally necessarily a philanthropist you want to mm. do this because ultimately originally it was from a selfish reason I want to exactly. the glory of playing or, or in the end coaching um, so what kind of goals did you set yourself did you kind of say if so and so hasn't happened by this time then I'm just going to pull out and go home and forget all about no, it. No this is the thing very quickly it became a matter of you've invested so much in this and you see the players and, and what this means to them and you're, you're talking about an island with a fast obesity rate where right. kids are given no opportunity to play sport from a young age um, and suddenly these players are kind of saying to you you are going to come back aren't you you know you yeah. are going to you are going to keep this going <laughs> and you think this isn't really about me anymore this mm. is much more important this is a country where nobody has ever tried to encourage these people to, to play mm -hmm. I've got to do this yeah. um, and however far into debt I go and it was a long way um, <laughs> you, you, you just have to do it because you only really get one opportunity like this in your, in your life yeah. and what I thought I wanted which was this kind of this hollow symbol of oh, I, I was an international footballer something to tell at a dinner party and people are going suddenly Whoa. became suddenly was actually can I bring about a fundamental change mm -hmm. to the structure of an island in the Pacific that I was starting to see more and more as my home amazing um, and the, so let's hopefully we can shift quite a lot of units of this so that you can pay back the debts that you got yourself into. It would be quite a few. <laughs> if well, everyone out there could just buy 30 or 40. Yeah, if every, <laughs> please do. Uh, make sure you buy as many copies of this as you possibly can. Um, but it's a, it's a, there's a moment in this where you I really, all the, you're following your journey in this because it's very much a personal journey and you sort of start to, to feel for the, the players and the, the regular characters who are, you know, they are real. But for you, and I love it, I love the, the story when the moment when you, the, the team play the Rovers mm. and lose, but they play really well. And it must be particularly galling as a Bristol City fan that they're their first... Our first game in Guam. first game is yeah, against the Rovers. The first organised <laughs> competitive match yeah. and we've been building up to it for months. Playing a team called Rovers uh, and I obviously we had to win yeah. and we didn't. We, no. we lost 3-2, we missed a series of great chances. Mm -hmm. In honesty, the players were just a bit out of their depth in right. terms of um, the build-up had been so great, the, mm -hmm. the hype, and we suddenly get these glittering facilities in Guam when they've been training on this kind of frog-addled, mm -hmm. Where they were actually out of their depth in the rain. Out of in the rain, <laughs> you know, and suddenly we're in Guam and they played great football okay. and they were so pumped up, but it was just that was our, I mean, that's, that's our pitch in Pompeii. Pitch. That's what we're so used to. So you went to Guam, you lost to Rovers, but then you had the big match. The against, big match uh, against uh, the Crushers. And no, I think um, we've got some footage of that. Yeah, <laughs> so from, from Guam TV. Look, and yeah, from Guam TV. It wasn't uh, on so match talk us day. through. <laughs> um, it might have been on the league show, at least one show. <laughs> <laughs> they show pretty much anything on that. <laughs> okay, well, let's have a look. Uh, so this is, talk us through Ah, yeah, so here. we're in the blue. Um, and that, I think, is them coming quite close. Dilshan here, the playmaker. Uh, and this is Ryan now going through with the ball, passes to Matthew, and we're ahead. It's a lovely what it, one. It was a nice little goal. We carved them up. Their goalkeeper was fairly fat, but um, <laughs> that's not really relevant. And the second goal is kind of a carbon copy, really, to be honest. Um, we're at this was point, that offside? Do, what was the referee um, like? He wasn't offside, actually, okay. but they had really good official referees there. Um, we're going absolutely nuts on the sideline. Me and, and Matt's returned. You see Matt returns to help me coach in, in Guam. Um, this is Dilshan, it cuts the ball back. Bang. What a great goal. Lovely goal. I lovely mean, we were, they were playing lovely football um, and it was almost <laughs> like, it was as if, you know, the whole of Pompeii and sporting history had been building up to this moment mm. of, we're actually going to win this. There's no messing around here. Um, Pompeii had never, as far as I know, and people certainly said Pompeii had never won mm -hmm. a competitive sporting event in Guam at any level, at anything. And there was this sudden feeling that actually, why is that? You know, this mm. is a group of fantastic athletes. We've been training. We were training five days a week coming into there. Mm -hmm. We were doing gym sessions at six in the morning. This was a, a group of determined athletes playing Superb. in what they would see as their biggest event of their lives. Mm. There was a lot of pent up aggression there. <laughs> and 7-1 was, was, was always coming. 7-1. So uh, we'll, um, we'll talk a bit more about that and about uh, up Pompeii uh, when we come back after the break. Uh, join us then. Welcome back to the book club on Sports Tonight Live where uh, we're talking about Up Pompeii uh, by Paul Watson with 
Paul Watson uh, and a brother of Mark Watson, a yes. stand-up comedian. Did he yes. have any influence on you going into writing? But you were already working as a, a sort of writer of sorts. Yeah, I was a football journalist for yeah. Channel 4. Um, the book does owe a lot to my childhood with Mark, actually. We, uh, we were just addicted to football. I had very little choice being the younger brother. I was kind of born for, in his eyes for the purposes of someone to play against. Right. Um, <laughs> so from a very young age, it was, you're a football fan, you like Bristol City. Mm. Uh, and I've never known anything different. Uh, I mean, I've never wanted exactly to. That's exactly like my life as well. I think too. a lot of people yeah. probably find that. So, yeah. a lot of it is the fact that we, instead of playing, you know, this kind of I'll be Germany, you be England, mm. we did get to that point where, you know, we would play laborious qualification processes mm. for tournaments we would create in the garden when we were, you know, he was seven, I was four, and we'd be <laughs> playing these kind of. So, it was inevitable to some degree that eventually it would take this turn, I mm. think. Yeah. Even if I didn't know it. Yeah, very good. Now, um, uh, as an innovation uh, for the book club here on Sports Tonight Live, we've started to open this out to make it more of a book club. Uh, and I think we have Stephen on our Skype wall, uh, who we've sent a copy of the book to. So it's like a, a two-way. It's like the, the Arts Review show on BBC Two or something. Um, steady. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen, how are you doing? Tell, tell us where you are, remind us. Um, I am in Nottingham at the moment as a student, but originally from Manchester. Uh, and uh, you're a Manchester City fan, as we can see from the various m memorabilia around you. Um, uh, first question, of course, is what did you think of uh, Up Pompeii? Bearing in mind we have got yeah, the this could be an awkward yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I thought it was a very good read, actually. Um, your passion comes across very strongly indeed, and it's almost, you convey very well the sense that how passionate you are for the team and the players as individuals. And reading, I mean, I got sent it this week and I finished it in a couple of days because you keep wanting the players to do well and you want to find out the results. And I think it is lighthearted at times. You mentioned people like Tasafi Bramble. Um, and one of my best mates is actually a Stockport fan. So I've heard about him and, you know, you get all the hyperbole, he's the worst player ever, he shouldn't be playing football. <laughs> and then you find out he's an international footballer, so you've got to look further down the chain. But no, it's a very good read and I would recommend it. Oh, that's nice. And, um, <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned just before the break that uh, uh, your sort of your, your partner in crime, Matt Conrad, mm. had gone away because he went to study uh, film in LA. And at that moment, yeah. I thought, oh, there's going to be a documentary out of this. You're going to make a <laughs> film. Is that is that happening? Because it does read yeah. like something you'd see on TV. There is. He's okay. um he's actually got about 85 hours of footage that he's picking his way through the poor guy. So he was filming the whole time you were... He was filming a lot of it, okay. yeah. Um, and right now he's kind of in the process of making uh, the documentary. Mm -hmm. He's actually got it on a website called Kickstarter. You can oh, right. donate to, to oh, help good. the documentary so get made. Kind of right. Yeah, I think he wanted to do it that way rather than sell it somewhere where it runs the risk of being turned into a kind of mm -hmm. ridiculed story. We were very protective of, of the island and the people yeah. in that if you just say to a TV company, have this and do yeah. what's most commercial, yeah. they'll probably turn it into a joke, really, yeah. and belittle the people involved. So I think what you did really well, Stephen, I don't know if you agree, is that um, uh, the, the, because you needed to generate publicity, uh, you obviously have to say they're the worst team in the world, mm. you know, there's an obese island. But the, I don't, Steve, I don't think he handled that well, the kind of being sort of slightly mean about the island to generate publicity, but then supporting the island as well. Well, it is. It must be a tough act to, to find the right balance between seeing the sun, I think it was, promoting it as the worst, the worst team ever. Mm. But, I mean, it's hard because people are more likely to contribute to something, I would imagine, contribute to something that does actually have potential and that you clearly invested a lot of time and money into it. And I think it's worthwhile because it does have that feel-good factor and you clearly made a difference. It's actually really nice to hear you saying this, but... Um, it's actually the biggest regret that I have through the process uh, was the involvement with the press that we had. Mm -hmm. um, we did think we could find sponsors in, in the UK because, as I say, we had to end up basically doing it all ourselves and, and that was quite a terrifying prospect. I didn't have any money to do this with, really. It was going to mm -hmm. be debt. So we thought the press would be the lesser of two evils. We never directly said this is the worst team in the world, but it doesn't take someone like The Sun long to find Wikipedia and mm. work that out. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the biggest regret I had was that in some way it felt like I was belittling the Islanders. It took me a long time to get over the, that feeling of maybe in some way I've betrayed something yeah. here. Um, and it, in the end, it didn't really work. We didn't get any sponsors from all that press. Right. Um, so it really, at that point, I hit kind of a low that I thought, I've actually just 
gone to an island, come back, ridiculed yeah. the people yeah. nationally. Heckled them internationally. Heckled them internationally, yeah. received no funding, and mm. now I'm going to go crawling back mm. there to a, an island that probably hate me, and most of them own machetes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, d did you, when they beat the Crushers 7-1, for me, that was a real kind of sitting on the tube, yes, moment, you know, that when the music swells, when Rocky gets to the top of the stairs. Uh, did, you, did you have like quite an emotional response to it, Stephen? I did, and I think, I remember that the first game, I think, was it 2-1 you lost? Against 3-2, three, three, two, two, yeah. 3-2, yeah. Three, yeah. sorry, but by all accounts, you played very well. So that must have given you pride and hope that you could actually compete, and then to go and win 7-1 must have been beyond any expectations. But then the final game, obviously, against the, was it the under-19 national team? Yeah. That was by no means a humiliation, which you may have feared. So I think there's clearly potential there. And for uh, someone who's never really had any coaching experience, it must be fantastic to actually see the players improve and produce a result like that. It was, yeah. I mean, it was, it was actually pretty emotional. Um, yeah. You've been through quite a journey with a lot of these players and their backstories. Quite a lot of them have had quite tough lives mm -hmm. and never really been encouraged. And almost the ones that gave you the hardest time at the start, when you see them at the end, you feel the most emotional attachment yeah. when you see what they can achieve. Yeah. And yeah, it's quite a journey. I was trying to imagine, Steve, I don't know if you were doing this, I was trying to imagine what kind of a manager you were, because of course, as a football <laughs> fan, and but also a kind of person, a 21st century contemporary man, mm. you're very aware of, not, of whether you're going to be an, uh, Sir Alec Ferguson or you know, a Red Knapp or mm. uh, what kind of manager you were. What, uh, and it seems like you were very passionate, but you almost had to fight against your desire to be a really cool, a standoffish manager on the, on the touchline. I, I really like the <laughs> idea of being this kind of cool, standoffish, um, <laughs> you know, you, Jose Mourinho style, although perhaps not so much the histrionics, but I had this idea of being suave. And <laughs> instead, I was a sweaty wreck within about five minutes of our first game. It's about 45 degrees in Guam on the day of our first game. Uh, and our bench had no cover on it. We were just stood on the sunlight, um, sidelines with sun directly on our face. So instead of being this kind of cool, laid back mastermind, I was this sweaty, <laughs> gibbering wreck, <laughs> yelling absolutely garbage at the players. I don't think anyone understood what I was saying, even myself for most <laughs> of the game. Um, so yeah, I think I learned a lot about why managers perhaps don't portray themselves as people think they should. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, you, you didn't, even though in one of the, in the third game in Guam, mm. uh, when it poured torrentially with, uh, you know, yeah. with um, monsoon rain, uh, you stood there proudly and got drenched. You, did, you weren't a wally with a brolly. That was, no. of, that was a key moment. <laughs> it felt kind of like my final moment of Pompeii. You know, I was, I was, by that point, we were so used to being drenched. It was a matter of, we're going to stand here and get yeah. drenched with our players. Yeah. We're not going to sit there mm. in the lovely cover of the bench and... Um, and to be honest, when you're that nervous, you can't sit down. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be on your feet. Imagine, of course. Yeah, yeah. And so you've put so much heart and soul into it. Uh, Stephen, is there anything uh, you particularly wanted to ask Paul uh, about the process of making the book? Um, well, there's a couple of questions. One um, is, was there any stage when you thought, when you were actually in Pompeii and Matt was in America, that you'd do it alone? Ooh, um, I had to go through a few moments where I thought this probably isn't something I'm capable of. Uh, and when Matt didn't come back for that trip and we'd had the bad press and I went over there, there was this moment when I got there of kind of, this might not work out. I might just have to come back, you know, within a week mm. with my tail between my legs. But actually, Dilshan was kind of key. I went back and he took me under his wing and smoothed out any kind of problems there might be. And he was became like a brother to me really on the island. and. It was through our relationship that I managed to kind of keep myself going, really. It sounds like um, Dilshan is someone that Mancini could be looking at for, uh, for next, <laughs> next year. Uh, another question from you, Stephen, if that's all right. Um, well, just to pick up on Dilshan, he was, or by the sounds of it, the best player by a distance. Mm. What sort, just to get an idea, what sort of level could he play <laughs> at in England? <laughs> Um, well, that's a very good question because you actually say in the book the mm. one question that everyone always asks is if they were an English uh, team, what <laughs> league would they be <laughs> in? And that's a, that's a nice twist on that, Stephen. Well done. It's uh, a good question. It's yeah. a really good Where question. Where would Dilshan be playing? Um, I think he would be playing in the conference, the football conference, okay. in honesty. Um, and I think that with some work, his, his technique isn't the problem. I think he would need to bulk up and toughen up. Uh, I make this joke with Dilshan that, I mean, he was a more talented footballer than mm. I was, but he wasn't as kind of tough as I was because I've just grown up playing English football you mm. get kicked yeah. so I kind of made this joke with him that you know the one thing I can teach you 
is how to get kicked. Right. And so I would mark him as you would mark someone in an English league match, and I would give him all that. And he loved it. He <laughs> really loved the kind of physical side. Cool. But I think that would be where he would struggle in, say, the conference, because okay. I just can't imagine him dealing with the amount of kind of physical contact there is. But his technique, technique-wise, he could play professionally. I still okay. believe that. Well, uh, let's keep an eye on him for, for next season. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And being our first ever yeah. member of the book club proper. Uh, thank you very much. That's fine. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, Steve. Thank you. Um, so I guess the question now is, have you closed the, is, is the book closed? Have you, are you going back to Pompeii? Are you, is your involvement, are you still involved with the team? Um, I would love to go back, but I mean, not to work. I'd love to go back to visit. Right. Um, the, so the, they're now up and running? You, you've, you've established them? They're up and running. Um, Dilshan took charge when, when oh, okay. I left. We, it was always going to be the case. We mm -hmm. kind of almost tried to train him up to some degree to coach. Um, oh, yeah. uh, it was a natural progression from captain of the state team mm -hmm. to coach of the state team. And also he had been coaching them before I'd arrived. Mm -hmm. um, and he did a wonderful job. The league's now grown and grown and grown. The, the sport spread to the neighbouring islands. Um, but now he's left, Dilshan's now left to go and play football in the US. And now right. you have this kind of problem where a lot of the guys who went to Guam as the, as the Pompey players are coaching on the island. But is anyone quite able to take football under their wing administratively wow. as well as uh, as well as physically? And one of the biggest uh, frustrations for me was the fact that FIFA just made life difficult. They they wanted so many hoops jumped through. Right. Uh, there's a kind of a catch twenty two that in order to get funding to develop football, right. you have to have so many structures in place. Right. You have to have men in suits to, to yeah. have meetings and bylaws. And well, um, uh, hopefully we've got some, some men in suits watching now who may be able to help. But uh, one way you can help certainly is by buying the book. <laughs> it's <laughs> up on pay by Paul Watson, who's been a, a superb guest. Uh, uh, just quickly, uh, mm. you're doing a, a launch next week? Yeah, uh, launch at Daunt Books uh, in Chelsea, which is on Fulham Road. Uh, okay. And that's on Thursday the 9th of February. Uh, from about 6.30 p.m. Okay, but great work and lovely to meet you. Well Thank you, you too. Thanks. And uh, join us next time for uh, Sports Tonight Live's book club uh, when we'll be doing another book. Thanks, goodbye. Stay ahead of the game with Sports Tonight Live. Don't miss a thing. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Search for Sports Tonight Live on Facebook and like our fan page. Follow Sports Tonight TV on Twitter and tweet us your thoughts and opinions. Sports Tonight Live, it's the platform for the fans.